Okay, well, um, good morning, everybody. And I feel a little bit like I should say hello to the viewers at home or something. <laughs> so um, this time last year, I was um, keeping a secret um, because in the late summer of 2020, I was involved in a small excavation after the discovery of a mosaic in a farmer's field in Rutland. And such were the circumstances that we weren't allowed to tell anyone. So it was this sort of dark secret that we, we kept for quite a while. But in a way, um, we can actually thank COVID for the discovery because the story of the discovery almost has like a, a sort of quality of a fable about it, really. I mean, as, as we all know, 2020 um, was the strangest spring. And of course, lockdown was keeping everybody kind of close to home. And, you know, going for a walk was pretty much the new socialising at, at that point. So this was actually where the, the journey began, really, with um, Jim Irvin, the um, farmer's son, who was walking in um, his father's fields, and he noted a scatter of pottery. Now, he was quite excited by this, and he looked at the available satellite imagery online, and that revealed a number of crop marks, which, you know, to Jim's eyes, looked rather like a church or something, but certainly something very exciting in that field. And his interest was so piqued that um, um, when, the, when the summer came, he went back with his family and um, he took a spade and he dug a small hole and he hit a, um, a hard surface and that led to digging a bigger hole and that led to pretty much the discovery of a, a lifetime. So what he had actually found was um, a mosaic which is one of the most unusual that has ever been found in Britain. Um, it's a story taken from Homer's Iliad featuring this sort of epic battle between Achilles, the Greek hero, and the Trojan um, prince um, Hector, along with what happens afterwards, a rather sort of bloody aftermath, really. Well, Jim uh, reported this amazing story to... Um, to the relevant authorities and Historic England decided that they would pay for a small investigation. So this is a point at which ULAS, University of Leicester Archaeological Services, were called in. So our remit was to record what was exposed in the trench and sort of just slightly sort of um, chip away at the sides really so that we can see what the overlying um, deposits would have been over the, the mosaic. Now, this first excavation, it was very small and it was rather a lockdown treat, really. Um, it was sort of thrilling because it was just a few of us in a field in the summer with a stunning mosaic. <laughs> so it's sort of a far cry from um, digging a cold, wet ditch in the winter and sort of wondering why the hell you're doing this, really. Um, and none of us were left in, in any doubt as to the importance of this discovery either. But when the work was completed, we backfilled the trench and um, we didn't actually know whether we were going to get the chance to go back again. So it's just covering it all up, right? Okay, you know, leave the field. But um, Historic England were quite keen to commission more stages of work because they needed to put in an application to have the site scheduled. <laughs> so a lot of this work included SUMO's extensive and you know, hugely successful geophysical surveys, which were then followed by trial trenching around the periphery of the area. And we also did a cosmic test fitting survey, which is essentially digging a load of holes to assess the, the preservation of the archaeology and how much sort of um, topsoil and subsoil cover there is over the top of it. In other words, is it well protected or is it at threat from ploughing? But once this was over, um, what then really? Well, <coughs> naturally, we were rather desperate to um, return and we had some good research objectives but any work undertaken still needed to be funded. And we were also, at that point, still trying to protect the secrecy of the site, but at the same time, we knew it was going to be of huge public interest. But once again, COVID, rather bizarrely, came to our aid. So thank you, COVID. <laughs> um, <laughs> so excavation opportunities in 2020 had been completely scuppered for the students of um, Leicester University, and um, they'd missed out on an essential component of their course. So they needed to do a second batch of field work um, in 2021 to sort of make this up. And this was basically where um, you know, our interests coincided, as it were, and it's where the, the Rutland Villa Field School was born. 
as you can imagine, it took rather a lot of meetings and discussions between the various parties involved to agree a strategy for the work. But finally, a trench plan was agreed. I think if I press this, hopefully, yeah, the trench plan appears. Um, it looked really great, actually, but I could see already it was going to be rather a lot of work. And that was at the point at which my um, project manager, John, um, told us that Digging for Britain would be joining us. Now, if I'm going to be honest here, and I will be, <laughs> I have to say that although I could really appreciate why there was, this was going to be an excellent idea, and um, there was a part of me that was actually screaming in, in horror at the, the thought of it all, um, but at the same time, you know, we, we knew that this was such a genuinely exciting site. We, we needed to have as many means as possible to communicate this to the public when, you know, when that was appropriate. So I resolved that I was kind of just going to, OK, just go with the flow. It, it'll be fine. Go with the flow. Um, and at this point, I should really make it clear that um, the film crew were, you know, they, they were keen to keep the process informal and they were all nice, approachable people. Um, and Alice Roberts is really good at sort of putting you at your ease when she um, talks to you. So I just want to make it clear that this isn't a criticism of the programme. You know, it's more about a clash of agendas and, and methods, really, because ultimately we all wanted the same result, which is to share what we're doing you know, with, the, with the public. So I'll say the filming experience proved interesting, but it certainly wasn't always comfortable. Um, and it really kind of got me thinking about how we communicate archaeology and the many different ways of, of doing this. So... I think we'll just start, I mean, I, I'm not going to kind of try and cover what um, Manda's already um, taken us through, really, but it's probably true to say that there has been growing interest in archaeology over the past few decades, and I think there's probably several reasons for this, really. Um, I think it in part, it kind of stems from um, perhaps the greater visibility of archaeology in society. I mean, if we think about how many excavations are done after PPG 16 um, was put into place, you know, suddenly people are seeing excavations happening in their own neighbourhood. You know, it's there, it's visible, it's going on around you. So that's bound to sort of pique people's interest. Um, this one might also be related to kind of greater travel opportunities. I mean, you go to other countries, you see amazing upstanding archaeology. You know, what's happening in your own, in your own backyard? And I think that in, you know, the, probably the most important thing really is just this increase in accessible information about the subject. I mean, as we know, presentation takes many forms. So we've got lectures like this, talks, exhibitions, class, um, classes, <coughs> workshops, field schools, <laughs> as well as the traditional sort of books and papers about archaeology. Um, but in more recent years, um, obviously, we have got a lot of online content now, dedicated websites, um, twi Twitter, Facebook, all that stuff. And this has really sort of increased people's ability to explore the subject um, themselves. I mean, that's not actually the focus of my talk today, but um, certainly I think, you know, as we've seen, online presence has um, grown massively since the pandemic began. But heading back to TV, this is still a big player for a lot of people. Um, it offers usually quite a kind of slick and polished um, interpretation. And the relationship between archaeology and television um, is not new. I mean, archaeology has been featured in programmes um, since the 1950s. You can just kind of see Mortimer Wheeler in the, the corner there with his amazing moustache. Um, usually there was a kind of an expert presenter to kind of guide the viewer through the story. And Digging for Britain is like the, the sort of modern interpretation of this, really, that it's... Um, follows this kind of style presented by Alice Roberts, who takes us through, showing us significant excavations taking place all over Britain. And it certainly seems to be a very good programme with a wide audience, popular with archaeologists and non-archaeologists alike. And I think its main strength is kind of capturing that kind of real excitement of, of excavation. So in late summer, we arrived on the site, and very soon after, so did Rare TV. And for several of us on the project, this was like our first major encounter with a film crew. So we didn't really know what to expect. And maybe our experience is not typical as well. Um, 
Now, they were very keen to be sort of dynamic in what they did, sort of responding to moments of discovery and, and rushing in. And the timing of the project for them meant that they had to squeeze the work into their very end of their schedule. But they, you know, they realised this was going to be quite important in their series, so they rescheduled Alice Roberts so they could um, rush her onto site and sort of film her amazed reaction to the, the mosaic. But as the site director, I had two main concerns. So one was obviously how will the excavation eventually be portrayed in the programme? But I kind of knew that we really wouldn't have much control over this because footage is done, it goes away, it's edited in a way that you've got, you know, you'd have no idea how they're going to do it. And they will develop it to fit their own format and their own agenda. So it was mainly this sort of second question that bothered me the most at that point. Um, will filming impact our excavation? And it is true to say that it undoubtedly did in a lot of different ways. I mean, clearly there's a difference in perspective between the filmmakers and the archaeologists because we knew what we wanted to achieve from the excavation, but of course they're there to primarily capture that great story. And these two things are not always necessarily compatible. And for us, there were a lot of other factors that came into play, particularly in the early days. So we faced numerous challenges because the farmer had been unable to harvest because of um, bad weather the week before. And then the ancient combine broke down, which left us almost three days behind schedule. And we were then at this sort of point where we were worried that the, the trenches might not even be open for when the students arrived on site. So, you know, this was obviously create a huge load of problems and issues like um, changing our health and safety strategy, all these sort of things. So we actually ended up harvesting an area by hand so that we could dig the first <laughs> trench. And I have to say, it was brilliant fun. <laughs> it was there with a pitchfork, it was fantastic. Um, anyway, this, this delay was kind of not really... Um, helped by the requirements of the filming because the crew were there that first week and they wanted to do a number of um, interviews and get all their background shots in before the excavation started. So on several occasions we were actually told to stop working. Can you please stop working, keep the noise down because you know we're capturing this amazing rural atmosphere. <laughs> now some great footage resulted but it wasn't the ideal start for our excavation and after the harvest problems we actually decided to drop our trenches which had actually been, there was an original fourth trench but we had to drop it to a more realistic three trenches. So the following week our students arrived, field work began in earnest and of the three trenches as you can imagine the most pressure was on in the mosaic trench. We had to get that mosaic exposed before the end of the two weeks of excavation, in fact hopefully considerably before so we could actually record the damn thing but <laughs> To do that, we had to get excavate those sort of crucial upper layers of archaeology, which hadn't really been looked at the first time round, and were obviously you know, of great interest. And we had to um, recover as much information as we could about the later history of the site. So um, the film crew were kind of excited by the possibility that we might not actually make that deadline. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, it just adds some jeopardy to the situation, <laughs> which was... Yeah, comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of ironic, really, that at a time when we're kind of racing against the, um, the clock, the TV cameras actually slowed our work down a bit, you know, because activities have to be repeated and filmed multiple times from different angles to get that perfect shot. And continuity was an issue as well. So if you were not in the trench for a certain shot, then you, weren't, you couldn't go back into the trench until you know, until they'd sort of finished that sequence or whatever, which at times did actually impact on interactions with the, the students as well. So, I mean, not massively, but it was something I was very aware of because I was juggling a kind of multitude of, of tasks. So by the end of that first week, um, we were kind of beset with scorching heat as well, which didn't help, so lots of students flaking out all over the place. <laughs> And um, there were lots of rubble layers that still had to come off. Um, and the pressure was growing and everyone's like, when is it going to be open? When is that, you know, when are we going to see the mosaic? So I had to call in the big guns. And in this case, that is um, some of my very dedicated colleagues at, at ULAS who volunteered to come in and shift rubble to get the project back on track. 
and they well they they did a brilliant job they were great they you know earth was shifted in, in a way it certainly hadn't been in the the previous few days <laughs> no offense to the students but you know obviously we're used to doing this day in day out and of course they they're not you know it's yeah <laughs> so after at that point i sort of finally thought yes we might actually see that mosaic again but there were still the layers under the rubble to be removed and the pressure was pretty intense, um, but we devised a sort of grid system over the mosaic and everybody had a little area of soil to um, excavate. But if there was any kind of exclamation of excitement, such as perhaps a bit of pottery has been found or um, a bit of human bone, oh, that, that always gets everybody. Um, or in um, the case of um, Christoph there at the bottom, he's just uncovered a chariot wheel, which is fantastic. So um, immediately those cameras are going to swoop in and sort of try and capture that exciting moment. But finally, finally, we um, actually, after, you know, kind of very intense bit of chaos, really, we got um, the remaining soil off and finally revealed that mosaic at last. And um, for me personally, this was a moment of incredible relief, you know, that we'd actually done, you know, fulfilled that main aim. We can now actually start to record. However, since the fieldwork has ended, I've had some time to reflect on this experience. So what I'm going to offer you is the, a load of thoughts that you might find a bit contradictory, but I'm hoping that if any of you find yourselves in a similar position, you might, you know, you might just have these things in, in mind, really. So an indirect result of filming that troubled me, and this is particularly the case with the students, um, the perce uh, their perception of the relative importance of the archaeology was effectively defined by where those cameras were going. So um, this is where we come back to the kind of different agendas of archaeology and television. So quite understandably, from the TV's point of view, there was a strong emphasis on the spectacular stuff over the, the less glamorous aspects. I mean, you don't even have to be interested in archaeology to look at the mosaic and go, wow, do you? So, yeah, you can see why, why that was the case. But, of course, it isn't all about the mosaics. I mean, one of the strengths of archaeology is the fact that we explore those everyday activities. So the things that really um, tell us about what people were doing and how they were living. And although all the trenches were filmed for the programme, there was much less emphasis on those other areas. And the students kind of felt that this made their, the work in those trenches was, was less important to the project somehow. And it was very hard for us to try and counteract this despite our best efforts, really. And sadly, it wasn't remedied when the programme went out because one of the trenches didn't even feature at all. So, I mean, of course, they could only show a fraction of the excavated archaeology. But just to make the point that, you know, what you see there is the simple story, if you like. The real picture is so much more complex and involved. Another thing to consider is whether or not there is a risk of early interpretations becoming perceived wisdom about a site. So what you say on site when, you know, you've got a camera poking in your face or, or whatever, but, you know, this is an initial impression. And these are things that might even change from day to day. You know, as you dig something else up, it's like, OK, right, um, that, that's actually not quite what I thought it was. So the programme is inevitably based on initial conclusions so that, and you haven't got any later meanings um, from the, the work on finds and, um, you know, and, and samples and analysis of the stratigraphy. None of those sort of real important um, methods actually you know, get incorporated into to, um, this interpretation. And although... Um, in my view, certainly, post-excavation work is easily as important as field work, but it often lacks that kind of immediate excitement. And you just sort of think, well, will anybody follow up on this in, at a later date? Um, you know, and how will we communicate any changes in, in the narrative? But, I mean, is this just me nitpicking? Are these sort of minor niggles, really? Isn't the main objective to simply communicate our discoveries and raise awareness? Um, 
And in this case, of course, the mosaic trench has been backfilled. So not many people actually got to see it. Not many people were privileged enough to see the actual mosaic. So in that case, these images, in all their forms, are a kind of, they're the only way to communicate that as widely as possible. And I suppose, if I'm honest, although details matter a lot to us as archaeologists, perhaps they don't matter quite so much to the general public, as long as the story is broadly accurate. So, I mean, there are other benefits as well, aren't there? You know, I know we've talked, you know, other speakers have talked a little bit about this, about raising the profile of a place, um, helping people connect with their locality and um, its heritage. And, you know, people seeing their local site on television and saying, that's, that's ours, you know, just, it encourages people to get actively involved. And, of course, let's not leave out ULAS, um, the department and the university. Well, we're all fighting for relevance here, aren't we? Um, you know, com so communicating high-profile research by the institution, particularly at this current time when archaeology departments are being closed, then you know, this is obviously of huge benefit to, you know, to archaeology and to the university to help keep them, uh, um, keep their profile raised, really. And of course, ultimately, that could lead to funding, hopefully extra students, and um, so who might go on to be archaeologists themselves as well. So, in conclusion, really, this site has been an absolutely extraordinary and mind-boggling <laughs> experience for me, certainly. And there are many thoughts that are still rattling around in my head. Um, it certainly seems clear that the publicity arising from programmes like this is overwhelmingly positive, which is great. You know, and we are communicating our discoveries to a wider and more diverse audience all the time. And that's so important in the world that we're in at the moment. And I think this has also been exacerbated by COVID. I mean, you know, Manda told us quite a lot about this in, in an in earlier talk. Um, and all this feeds into the idea that archaeology needs public interest. We need people to appreciate and value what we do. Because if they, if they don't, if there's no consensus that archaeology is important, then councils aren't going to pay for staff to monitor the planning <coughs> process. Developers aren't going to pay for archaeological fieldwork. And of course, it's hugely rewarding to share our discoveries. So there's no doubt that programmes like this draw people in and fire their imaginations. But I think there are some practical lessons to learn from the on-site experience. Um, so um, we shouldn't underestimate the potential impact of, of filming on excavation, recording and teaching time. I don't think that we were prepared for how long the crew needed to be on site and the disruption to site work. Hours of footage were shot and only a fraction was used. So if a similar situation arises again, I would want to have a fuller understanding of what was involved, dedicated time built into the project, and I'd want somebody from my team to coordinate and liaise with the film crew. So going with the flow isn't always the best idea. And finally, thinking a little bit more widely about publicity and actual content, I wonder if we could control our own agendas a bit more, have more confidence in the value of our works of society and the quality of what we produce. We often seem stuck in the mindset of being the poor relation, so having to prove what we do is worthwhile. But talking to people outside the profession, it's very clear that um, our need for publicity is more than matched by the public interest. So the onus is on us really to go beyond being passively grateful for publicity and to actually try and shape it into something that fits our own agenda a little bit more. So the challenge is to balance the thrill of excavation with demonstrating the need for carefully considered evidence and as we know this usually takes a combination of good strategies, um, strong evidence and a lot of effort because I think what you do find in the end is that the complete picture is usually worth a second or even a third look. <laughs>